uh, ritual of sacrifice, concepts of nature and nature conservation in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, and also uh, guardian spirits in, in, in Cambodia. And uh, today, we'll go on uh, to explore the articulation between analogism and animism in Thailand and Laos. But before that, let us listen to Professor Descula's uh, lecture on uh, animist, uh, animist ontology among the Amazonians. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. You have a high doses of Descola in, in these two days. Uh, in my uh, last uh, presentation, I think there's an open microphone somewhere, perhaps. No? There's a, an echo. <coughs> in my last presentation yesterday, no, it's all right, uh, I defined uh, the uh, ontological properties of the four modes of identification namely animism, uh, naturalism, analogism, and totemism. Uh, let me remind you very briefly uh, that by identification I mean uh, the uh, integrative uh, schema by the means of which I recognize differences and similarities between I and the objects of the world by uh, inferring analogies and distinctions of appearance, of behavior, of attributes between what I think I am and what I think the others are. These inferences are based on um, the uh, attribution or the detection of similar or dissimilar qualities uh, relating to what I call physicality <coughs> and uh, interiority. So when confronted with an um, alter, what, what an indeterminate alter. In Latin, there's an interesting distinction between alter and allude, uh, which has been exploited by philosophers. Uh, alter is an, uh, is an other, which is already specified by a relationship. Allude uh, is an other, which is not specified by a relationship. So in that case, the proper term would be allude rather than alter, but this is a small uh, <laughs> precision. Um, so when I'm confronted with uh, an allude, either human or non-human, I can uh, either surmise um, that uh, this object has elements of uh, physicality and interiority which are analogous to mind, and this I call totemism, or that his interiority and his uh, physicality are entirely distinct from mine, and this I call analogism, or that we have similar interiorities and different physicalities, and this I call animism, or the reverse, and this I call naturalism. Each of these modes of identification comes into existence under the guise of an ontology, which will favor one of these modes as the main organizing principle of the regime of beings, whether human or non-human. I would like today to examine the way in which these modes of identification express themselves in specific aggregating devices or specific associations. For each particular ontology also prefigures a kind of collective which is more specifically um, uh, adequate to the gathering within a common destiny of the types of being that this ontology distinguishes. By the word collective, which is a, a, a concept which I borrow from Bruno Latour, but in a very different sense than the one that he uses, we can come back to that later if you wish, uh, I mean a way of associating humans and non-humans in a network of specific relations, and this I uh, use by contrast, of course, with the traditional notion of society, which only applies, strictly speaking, to the subset of human subjects, uh, which are thus detached when they are designed, uh, when they are qualified by the word society, uh, which are thus detached from the fabrics of the relations that they maintain with the world of non-humans. In that sense, a collective, of course, corresponds only very, very partially to what we usually call a social system. 
if one takes seriously uh, the very diverse conceptions that people have had of their institutions in the course of history, uh, we have to admit that they seldom isolate the sphere of sociality among humans as a separate sphere or sp separate regime of existence and norms concerning the humans alone. As a matter of fact, one had to wait for the maturity of naturalism, that is in the 19th century, uh, for a specialized body of disciplines to emerge which would define as its main object of study uh, uh, the, the social or the humans as associated within specific uh, uh, forms and a special body of discipline that would attempt then as a consequence to detect and to objectify the field of practice, uh, this field of practice of sociality everywhere and without paying of course much attention to uh, local conceptions as if the content and the frontiers of this domain of society, let's say, were invariably identical to those that the naturalist had decreed. Now, it seems to me that far from being a founding prerequisite from which everything else is derived, sociality of the social, whatever you wish to call it, uh, 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 proceeds rather from the process of collecting and associating uh, in a common whole operated by each mode of identification. Thus, the property of being social, the property of sociality, is not what explains, which has been the common tendency in the social sciences. A fact is explained because it's social, and this is a decree, of the, the Camian decree. No? Uh, only social facts can explain social facts. Of course, it goes against the program of naturalism, nat of the, natu the so-called naturalist program, which has been quite uh, uh, amb amb ambitious in the past 30 years. It seems to me that what must be explained uh, is not so much sociality, uh, or rather that uh, <coughs> sociality is not what explains, but it is what must be explained. In other words, if one admits uh, <coughs> this, <coughs> if one admits that sociality is what has to be explained. If one <clears throat> recognizes that the major, major part of mankind has not until very recently made very stark distinctions between what is natural and what is social, nor considered that the treatment of humans and the treatment of non-humans belong to entirely different spheres, then, then one must apprehend the different modes of sociocosmic organizations as questions of distribution of patterning of beings into collectives. Who or what is assembled with whom or what, in what way, and for what purpose. And so this is an entirely different program uh, than the Boasian program or the Durkheimian program, of course. I will limit myself today to considering what are Amazonian collectives, but I think that part of what I'm going to say, and I'll take, uh, draw examples also from elsewhere, can be applied to uh, 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 other forms of animism elsewhere. What are the types of collectives that animism renders possible? In animism, you may remember that all the species endowed with an interiority analogous to that of humans are supposed to live in collectives that possess the same type of structure and properties. So they are what we would call societies, then full-fledged societies with chiefs, with shamans, with rituals, with dwellings, with techniques, with artifacts, uh, who assemble and quarrel, uh, who provide for their subsistence, who marry according to the local rules, um, and their social life 
as described by humans, in particular the social life of spirits, uh, <clears throat> is complex enough to fill all the usual headings of an ethnological monograph. One could write, and there's been some attempt, uh, that it, a successful attempt, to write a sort of ethnological monograph of spirits or spirit animals, etc., etc. So species here, and this is important, means much more than humans, animals, and plants. For in animic or animist systems, <coughs> almost every category of leads a social life. There's the great Russian ethnographer, uh, Valdemar Bogoras, wrote of the Chukchi of Eastern Siberia, I quote him, even the shadows on the wall form particular tribes and they live in their own country where they subsist by hunting. And the Chukchi are no fools. They understand that the shadow is the, uh, the, the, the projection of flight, which is um, uh, interrupted by a, 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 a mass. But the idea here is that any visible form which is different from another form constitute a sort of natural, what we would call, a, we naturalists, a natural kind. So these collectives that are fully social and cultural also become distinguished from one another by the fact that their members have different morphologies, different physical dispositions, different behavior, etc. So this is why each collective is equivalent to what I call a tribe species, which establishes with other uh, tribe species relations of sociability at the same time than those that are held legitimate within the human collective, uh, which ascribes its internal organization, its system of values, and its mode of life to the collective of non-humans with whom it uh, interacts. So the so-called uh, natural and supernatural domains are in fact peopled by collectives with whom humans um, and human collectives establish relations according to norms that are supposedly common to all. So, uh, of course, this could, um, um, all the isomorphs, uh, collective of humans and non-humans, take as their working model a specific human collective. I would like to say a few words about this because I would like to dispel the implicit sociocentrism that such a proposition may seem to imply. I, in particular, I would like to underscore uh, the fact that using categories borrowed from the field of relations between humans in order to qualify relations with or among non-humans in no way amounts to a metaphorical projection. We have to be very clear about this. This was, for instance, a criticism that uh, those of you familiar with this literature may remember uh, that uh, Tim Ingold uh, uh, leveled at uh, Nurit Bert David uh, when she stated that the Nayaka of Tamil Nadu consider their environment according to a sort of overarching uh, unconscious metaphor that she defined as forest is as parent. And I agree with uh, Ingold, also I, some of you may know that I disagree on many other respects with, <laughs> with, with uh, Tim Ingold. Uh, I agree with Ingold when he remarks that uh, qualifying this forest is as parent as a metaphor is tantamount to restoring, in fact, the dualism of society and nature in the sense that uh, society is projected onto the forest uh, uh, as a sort of organizing principle. In order to understand the forest, it, we have to use uh, the uh, so sociological categories or social categories, such as the fact that the forest is as a parent. <coughs> Uh, 
Um, while, on, on the contrary, it is impossible, and in this I agree with uh, Ingold, um, uh, to trace among certain societies that Ingold call uh, hunting gathering societies and which I call animist societies. They are not exactly similar, but, well, I won't enter into that. It's impossible in these kind of societies to trace an absolute line of demarcation between the different spheres of implication that humans experience in their dealing with organisms, persons, whether human or non-human. However, however, in spite of this criticism, one must also admit that um, these polyvalent relations between beings in animist collectives are always, always, always formulated in the language of instituted relations between humans and not in the language of relations between non-humans. Whether in the Americas, in Siberia, even in some parts of Southeast Asia, these relations between humans and non-humans are always qualified by a vocabulary that evokes immediately relations between humans. Friendship, affinity, marriage alliance, the authority of elders uh, among uh, uh, the younger generation, adoption, uh, rivalry uh, between tribes, etc., etc. Among the Achuar of Ecuador, for instance, where uh, Anne Christine Taylor and uh, I did uh, fieldwork, the relationship of women with uh, cultivated plants is expressed verbally and very explicitly uh, as consanguineal relations of maternity, while the relations of uh, men to game animals is expressed in terms of an, a final relationship, either with the animals who are uh, uh, called uh, uh, brother-in-law or with the master of animal with a father-in-law. So it's in a, fi in a final relationship. Another example, which I, uh, I, I, I found very interesting because it, um, it uh, hinges on some difference between uh, uh, Southeast Asian and uh, American animism, let's say. Uh, it comes from Southeast Asia. And uh, it's, uh, I've taken it from a French missionary by the name of Father Kemelin, Emile Kemelin, uh, who lived among the Reungao of uh, the, uh, the highlands of central Vietnam uh, during the first decade of the 20th century. And it refers, it's, it's in a book on the in interpretation of dreams in particular, where um, uh, uh, Kemlin gives this, the following anecdote uh, about a woman named Oi. I quote Kemlin. One evening, as Oi was pounding rice on the veranda of her house, a tiger was struggling nearby, choked by a bone which had remained stuck in his throat. In one of the huge leaps that he made to get rid of the bone, the tiger reached the veranda. Struck by fear, Oi dropped a pestle which fell on the tiger's head. The tiger was so taken aback that he spat out uh, the bone, and he went away happily. During the night, the woman saw the tiger in a dream. We will enter into a friendship from father to daughter, said he. I do not dare. We, uh, who would be uh, bold enough to pretend such a bargain, answers uh, Oi. On the contrary, it is I who is afraid of suffering a rebuttal. Next morning, while Oi was in the forest, she met the tiger again, but in the flesh. He was carrying a huge boar. As soon as the tiger saw Oi, he unloaded his prey, cut it in two pieces, threw one to the woman, and went on with the other half. And this was not the only time when Oi was treated to such remnants, for from this day on, she only had to go to the forest to find pieces of deer or roe that her adoptive father left for her. So Father uh, Kemlin was a keen observer 
and his uh, ethnographical writings are given to understand on the Reungao, which were republished recently by the Ecole Francaise d'Extrême-Orient, uh, whose language he spoke very well, uh, are still a trustworthy reference. And Father uh, uh, Kemlin comments that the agreement passed between Oi and the Tiger is a covenant which has a name in uh, the Reungao language. It's of the type, I, so I, please excuse my uh, poor uh, uh, Vietnamese, Khao Komba. And this one, this kind of covenant is one of the various kinds of formal alliance which the Reungao can pass with humans and with non-humans equally. Each of them implying specific obligations for both parties. Now there are good reasons of a cognitive type that may explain why general schemas of relation of the type we've just seen are applying indifferently to humans and to non-humans may become uh, representable and liable to be stated only only by using the usual form in which these relations are known within the realm of interactions between humans. First, because uh, relations between humans are immediately uh, available, they are enacted uh, daily, and they are always marked, always marked linguistically, if only by kinship terms. While relations between non-humans are either formally identical to those between humans, I mean linguistically, and liable to be qualified by the same terms, that is maternity, conjugality, rivalry, uh, predation, etc., are much more difficult to uh, qualify precisely. Let's not forget that uh, we had to wait until the 20th century in the naturalist regime for scientific ecology to describe and to name precisely phenomena uh, such as parasitism, commensality, biotic successions, etc. These phenomena were known, of course, by anyone, but they were not formulated. They are, they are in, in, in South America, in Amazonia, there are terms that define these, uh, these, uh, these uh, ecological uh, 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 forms of association. Um, well, they're not terms, but they, are, they, are, they play a very important role in myths for instance. So they are, they are identified, but they are not named by specific names, no. Also, the relations between uh, <coughs> humans appear more formalized, since their content is specified by uh, specific rules of behavior, and their normativity confirmed by uh, the predictable uh, repetition uh, of prescribed attitudes. And finally, the conformity of these uh, relations to a rule may be submitted to public scrutiny and the differences in their instituted expressions become more manifest when they are contrasted with the behavior of neighboring collectives and exercise, human collective, and exercise in comparison that old people like to practice. You know, the neighbors do such and such silly things while we do the right thing, etc., etc. So, the, 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 uh, the ability to define uh, certain forms of behavior is constantly discussed. So relations between humans thus appear as abstract and reflexive schemas that are easier to manipulate, easier to memorize, and easier to mobilize for an extended use than the relations detectable in the non-human uh, environment. Although the uh, animist collectives, um, cons uh, the, the animist collective conceive themselves on the model of, of species, it is uh, the, these are species which are hardly correspond to uh, the definition of modern systematics. Uh, of course, in both cases, in modern uh, taxonomy uh, uh, studies. And uh, in the case of animism, it is a collection of individuals that conforms to a type. However, no natural scientist will take into account the point of view 
of the members of a species in the characterization of its attributes and taxonomical boundaries, except perhaps in this form of a minimi uh, uh, mutual identification that a community of reproduction uh, implies. In the naturalist regime, then, the only species that can objectify itself, thanks to uh, the reflexive privilege granted by its uh, interiority, is the human species. The members of all other species are not supposed to know that they belong to an abstract set, which the, internal, the external point of view of the systematician has isolated according to its own, to its own uh, classificatory uh, 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 criteria. By contrast, the members of an animist species are reputedly conscious that they form a collective of their own with distinctive attributes of form, behavior, etc. And this collective self-awareness has um, elements uh, uh, fosters the, the idea that the members of the other collectives apprehend them with a point of view which is different from their own. A point of view which members of a collective must appropriate in order to experiment themselves as fully distinct. This is very common in uh, Amazonia. So in the naturalist um, classification or systematics, Species A distinguishes itself from species B because species C, that is Homo sapiens, says so in virtue of its human rational attributes, while in animist identification, I experiment myself as a member of species A, not only because I differ from members of species B by certain obvious physical uh, characteristics, but also because the very existence of species B allows me to know I am different since the members of species B have upon me a different point of view from the one I hold upon myself. So the perspective of the postulated classifier must then be absorbed by the classified in order to, for the latter, to see uh, himself as entirely specific. So this mechanism that uh, uh, a French colleague called uh, constituting alterity, uh, Philippe Erickson, is much more uh, than, which is very specific to, um, uh, which is very clearly uh, uh, visible in Amazonia, is much more than the simple specular representation of the self through the mirror of others, which is an old thing in philosophy, no? Uh, which is, a, in fact, a universal medium of the construction of individual and collective identities. Since this mechanism of constituting alterity is, uh, leads, in certain condition, to a complete identification with the point of view of the others. And in Amazonia, it takes an exemplary form which uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro, writing upon the Tupi, has very aptly uh, labeled the cannibal cogito. The, the ritual anthropophagy of the Tupi, um, is, uh, which is a f quite well-known uh, uh, phenomenon, this uh, ritual uh, anthropophagy is not a uh, narcissistic a, a, a narcissist absorption of qualities and uh, attrib attributes of uh, the other, or an operation of the earth differentiation, which has been also very much uh, uh, commented upon in psychoanalysis. No, I am not what I eat, for instance, no? which is a very simple process of differentiation. On the contrary, it is an attempt at becoming other by incorporating the enemy's point of view, which is the title in English of, 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 of a monograph by uh, Viveros de Castro, 
which opens up the possibility to escape from the self in order to apprehend oneself as a singularity. This is, I mean, uh, uh, it is the one I eat who defines what I am. So exocannibalism, headhunting, uh, the appropriation of uh, uh, various parts of the enemy's body, the capture of persons in neighboring tribes, all these phenomena uh, that were so common in Amazonia answer then to the same necessity, which is um, the building of selves cannot be achieved except by assimilating in a very concrete and material manner um, foreign bodies and persons, not as life-giving substances, and this is a difference perhaps also with Southeast Asian animism, not as uh, trophies uh, bringing prestige, uh, not as uh, labor providing uh, uh, captives, but as indicators of the exterior perspective that they hold on me as a result of their physical, positional origin. And I respond. Animist collectives are predicated on a species-specific physicality, as I said, no? Since the affiliation to each tribe species is based on the fact that all its members share the same physical appearance, the same habitat, the same diet, the same mode of reproduction, of locomotion, etc., etc. Now, and this is an important, very important aspect, this applies also to human collectives. In an animist ontology, the idea of mankind as a more species apart from any other becomes completely ludicrous. This is why each class of human would differ from another class by its appearance, by its behavior, is seen as a particular tribe species, much as the tribe species of the woolly monkey differs from the tribe species of the toucan or the tribe species of the caiman. For the distinctive attributes of humans, which we moderns see as cultural, the hairstyle, the ornaments, the clothing, the weapons, uh, the tools, the type of dwellings, even the language, are seen, on the contrary, in an animist ontology, as physical dispositions analogous to what allows animal and plant species to lead a distinctive lifestyle, that is, like beaks, like gills, like clothes, like fins, like roots, like rhizomes, whatever. Thus, it is in animism, and not in uh, totemism, in fact, as it was formerly conceived, um, that the biological species provides an analogical model for the composition of collectives. And this is possible because animist collectives, like the biological species, are never integrated in a functional whole at a higher level, because above uh, the Achua tribe species, for instance, the Tucan tribe species, the Peccary tribe species, there is nothing in common, nothing, except this very abstract predicate that anthropologists would try to make some sense of these arrangements called culture. So we may wonder how an animist cosmopolitics could take shape in such a case. Since almost all beings are persons, each free, independent, within the collective where it leads its life, political subjects cannot be equated with human individuals, nor even with the collectives within which each uh, species of human and non-human is associated with its conspecifics. So the true political subjects are, in fact, the relations between collectives. Relations of seduction, of exchange, of service, um, of predation, 
of taming, which are variable, of course, according to circumstances and according to communities, but relations which are all characterized by the fact that the alter ego from another collective is a person with an equal status to mine. A person whom I kill or whom I adopt, a person uh, whom I eat or whom I feed, a person whom, whom I help to reproduce or whom I treat as a child, a person whom uh, uh, I, with, with, with whom I deal every day, and a person, um, the differences in the forms of relation um, varying according to whether this person is a friend or an enemy, a game animal or a pet, a cultivated or a wild plant, a benevolent or a malevolent spirit. And it is in these very diverse relations of person to person between humans as well as with non-humans, that relations between, world, between worlds uh, crystallize. And these relations, that was the, the, the answer I gave uh, to uh, Courtney uh, uh, yesterday. These relations between worlds, um, um, I, um, the, I, 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 I was inspired by a French philosopher called Jacques Rancière, um, who argues, in fact, not at all by reference to animism, but to the contemporary situation, that um, the, um, it is relations between worlds that constitute the fabric of politics, much more than uh, power relations. For a political subject is not a group that becomes conscious of itself provides itself with a voice, um, imposes its weight on society. It is an operator which joins and disjoins the regions, the identities, the functions, the capacities existing in the configuration of a given experience. In that sense, whatever operator, whether human or non-human, is capable of becoming a political agent if it succeeds in putting together things which initially have no interesting connections, in particular because they apparently come under the jurisdiction of different ontological regimes. So the Ashwa hunter who addresses a mental spell to the soul of the holy monkey that he uh, chases is a political agent because it connects in this fashion two communities of persons who live in different worlds, in different physical worlds. As for the holy monkey, he has become also a political agent and for the same reason when he initially visited the dreams of the hunter so as to arrange a meeting with him in the forest, thus extending an invitation to be killed. It is no wonder then that when representatives of the native community of Sarayaku uh, came to Paris uh, on the occasion of the COP21 COP uh, conference meeting uh, to claim uh, legal recognition of the territory they occupy in the uh, Ecuadorian Amazon, they did, not do, they did not do so by invoking the preservation of biodiversity by invoking the protection of the environment from the damage done by oil companies which exist, no? Or even uh, by invoking a claim of autochtony. Instead, they argued that it was necessary to preserve relations rather than a space as such. As such. Namely, the kind of, res uh, the, the, uh, of relation they uh, argued had to be preserved, and I quote them in the document they left, is the material and spiritual relation that indigenous people have established with the other beings who inhabit the living forest. And the living forest is defined by them as entirely, I quote again, entirely composed of living beings and of the relations, and, that's an, and of the relations of communication that these beings maintain 
so that all these beings from the tiniest plant the tiniest plant to the protective spirits of the forest are persons runa in quechua because they the, it's a quechua speaking group who live in communities and develop their existence in a similar fashion to that of humans so instead of treating such statements and movements as expression of childish or childish or folkloric uh, superstitions uh, as both the neoliberal um, uh, states and the, also the, the Promotheon left has done for quite a while, it will be more judicious to uh, find in them what they can provide us with. That is a formidable uh, stimulation to rethink political action and the art of sharing a world where nature and society are not dissociated anymore. Thank you. Uh, for the sake of keeping time, I think uh, let's proceed to uh, the second paper and let's uh, keep your question uh, until the discussion time at the end. Uh, the second paper uh, will be that of uh, Dr. Stéphane Renaissance, who used to uh, write his dissertation on Thai boxing, which I find actually very interesting. But today he's going to talk about uh, game animals and uh, many, many kinds of games, animal beetles, birds, uh, fish, and compare it with Naka ritual. Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much, Atana Pinya. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was obliged, and I have to apologize, I have to, uh, to take the, the birds off since the, the cage was a little bit too small <laughs> for 25 minutes. So, um, the, the, the final title is Making Words with Beetles and Nagas, a few insights in Thai cosmologic cybernetics. Uh, this paper um, considers how the attribution of humans, animal and divine, divine characteristics to other kinds of beings, objects or matters, can work and combine with analogic networkings of correspondences as so many possibilities to make common worlds. To do so, we shall build on the Thai examples, uh, rhinoceros beetle fighting, on the, which are very famous here, not in Thailand on the one hand, and on the worshipping of Nagas in Northeast Thailand on the other. Besides the category of analogism coined by Nicola, which is very apparent already, I shall also draw on Charles Sanders' piece, Typology of Signs, as a way uh, to denote an object. Uh, where is it? Oops, 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 oops. Okay. Um, to do, um, yeah, sorry. Um, so it's, it's icon, index, and symbol. This typology classifies every sign according to the category of the sign's way of denoting its objects. The icon, also called semblance or likeness, denotes its object by a quality of its own. If we would take the idea of love, for example, it will be a question of this later on, maybe. <laughs> um, one could think of a drawing of a heart. Uh, the index denotes its objects by factual connection uh, to its subject. Uh, for example, an act of tenderness, a kiss, whatever. Uh, and uh, at, at the end, the, the symbol will denote its subjects by a convention or rule for its interpretant. And the, the word love itself would be a better example, example or even more a uh, letter, a love letter. So with this in mind, uh, it will be questioned here to assess to what extent it is methodologically interesting to consider that both these games and ritual spheres foster an equivocal and instable ontology of their protagonist. Let's start with the tripoom. Okay, uh, building, building on the iconic potential of uh, Mount Meru, I would say that what makes the Buddhist world depicted in the tripoom is a series of little differences in terms of spiritual achievement hierarchically organized. Still, if we consider uh, the beings that interest us today, there can be a doubt, actually a mystery, the possibility of not being what it looks like. Another representation of uh, the tripoom. Um, both uh, in their way, 
I'm speaking uh, uh, about uh, Beatles and, uh, and Naga, are a kind of potential co short circuit in the hierarchy of beings. In a word, very ambiguous if one considers their ontological status. So let's come to the, to the Naga first. And here, the region where I work there is just a little part of the northeastern, uh, northeastern part of Thailand along the, the Mekong River, as you can see. Uh, as Achan uh, has explained it yesterday, Nagas are very ambiguous beings since they can take the appearance of snakes, squirrels, or um, even human beings. They are said to be Sat Delachan. An animal that doesn't have consciousness, but yet Lao and Thai people acknowledge the Nagas as protector of Buddhism. For example, the Muchalinda is the name of the Naga who protected, who was supposed to protect the historical Buddha from the elements just after his enlightenment. Nagas have secured definitely, I would say, their status as guardian of Buddhism in another myth when a Prince Naga was denied the right to become a monk by the Buddha himself, on the ground that it was an animal. Nonetheless, in order to acknowledge and celebrate the Naga's goodwill, to, the Buddha decided that from that moment on, every man that was to be ordained as a monk should be, I check, ordained or <laughs> consecrated, uh, to be ordained as a monk should be called Naga. As a result, Nagas figures are overwhelmingly present in Buddhist temples, uh, at least as there and wells. As you can see a few examples here. Human and Nagas are thus in a kind of complementary state, squeezed in between Devachan, deity state, and Derachan, unconscious animals. The underworld, here is a depiction of the underworld, Muang Badan, is in some way in mirrors to ours. They have a social hierarchy, a political organization, and so on. They, have, they are said in some legends to even to be our cousins and provider of brides. I will skip all this because it can be interesting, but if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Nagas are called upon for rights uh, related to fertility, and they are actually renowned for controlling water's movements, uh, notably in North East Thailand, where some Prince Naga are supposed to have designed the Mekong River, like said Ajahn uh, yesterday. In the agrarian ritual cycle of the region, the Nagas are thus very called upon, either to contact with the sky's deities to ease the rain falling, and to preside personally to the convenient flowing of waters, hence forcing the, rot uh, the season rot rotation. To sum up, the Naga link the underworld, the surface, and the skies, the water, the earth, and the air, the animal realm, the human world, and the deity's territory. All the more, they are, li they are linked to the creation of the world. And as to finish, they symbolize also, quite conveniently, the quest for moral achievement in the Buddhist matrix. This is an example. Uh, they can thus embody raw power and fertility as much as the will to escape the world of suffering. But what interests me, actually, is, uh, the most are the modes of presence of the Nagas, notably the equivocal signals of their presence in the landscapes, in people's bodies and minds. They actually come in dreams. They can be seen as fleeting apparitions, leave traces on the ground, take the possession of a medium, or simply deliver messages through transfer, kind of telepathy technique. Only a few, manista a few, manista sorry, a few manifestations of the Nagas are observable at large. There are, of course, the iconic representations here and there that can be witnessed by anybody. Uh, there is also the famous Naga Red Fireballs uh, Bang Phai Payanak Festival. Uh, everybody that goes there can acknowledge the, 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 the Bang Phai coming up the, the river. Besides, Nagas are only seen, heard, and felt by a few special people that can connect with them because of their extraordinary sensibility, or even a level of moral achievement which is quite high, or Having been, having been a Naga in a one or few previous life. Medium thus, because it's about them, can talk about themselves by enmeshing with intricacy a series of correspondences between events penetrating their bi biographies and, on the other side, the Naga symbolic 
mythical and ontological features. As just a very quick example, uh, this is one of medium whose uh, hair, a kind of dreadlock, ends with the shape of a nine heads naga, which is supposed to be the result of her proximity or contiguity with nagas and also as one of her main tool for connect with them. As a matter of fact, one is never sure if and how mediums do connect with nagas. It's almost ungraspable if one considers telepathy or dreams, but even possession rituals sometimes hardly suggest the presence of the naga in the body of the officiant. If possession can be very spectacular, um, oh, sorry. Um, so the communication is quite hazardous, and mediums make an intensive and extensive use of the geomorphic uh, dimension of the environment to enhance the connectivity between the two worlds. Rituals are performed in what Angi was called yesterday, potent places, be they temples or the homes of the mediums, they are more than often ostensibly cosmically charged. These are regarded as specials, for they are places where Nagas are supposed to be able to go back and forth from subterranean world and to the surface. What you call Patu Payanak Naga doors. I will show you a few examples. So is Kamshanot, who you were told about yesterday by Ajahn Chayan. So this is the, the the, the, the door in Kamshanot connects the, uh, the underworld with... Uh, this is another... Here we are up a, a mountain. This is what you find under the rock. This is what happens around the rock. Here's uh, what is supposed to be the, the trace of the Nagam passage. Here's another hole in the, in the middle of a temple with iconic figure and the, and the hole also. And there, this is the house of a medium where you can see the not explained trace of, uh, let's say, very interesting in between iconic and indexical uh, naga. So the tension between the two polarities of the Naga, pure power on the one hand and symbol of spiritual elevation on the other, is typically engraved in the landscape outfit. These affordances sustain another geogra geography that is suggested first by the Naga's circulation between the river and the mountains for the sake of the season's rotation, and also building on the iconic convention of the Mount Meru I show you beforehand, suggesting that the spiritual elevation, uh, suggesting, sorry, the spiritual elevation of the Naga. So, it's also then suggested by, by the Naga's, um, uh, validated, sorry, ultimately by the circulation of the pilgrims and the worshippers themselves in their quest for the Naga's help, if I sketch it briefly, I would say that in the lowlands nearby the river, one will look for the help of the almighty Naga able to create the universe. Um, asking for an immediate answer to a problem, a wish, etc. In the upper lands, on, one comes to call upon the Naga's moral exemplarity for a spiritual guidance and willing to participate to, a, to the spreading of the Dharmic law. Mediums are necessary to the manifestation of Naga's strength when indexical materialization of Naga's potential movements and presence in the landscape constitute an essential support to the medium's activity. It is even more obvious when it comes to devotional ceremonies, Buang Suang. The presence of mediums in Buddhist temples are thus uh, uh, considered like conducting devotional ceremonies, you know, is explained in the terms of efficiency of the distributions of force, they use the, the word palang, of or moral force, barami, which is its, I, I guess, its refined and purified form when, fra when framed in a Buddhist ritual context. <coughs> they finally act like a kind of transmitter, facilitator for a kind of energy. And these are part of a circuit where they actually ape help to channel the force of the naga and the devotion of the pilgrim in the two directions. 
So let's now, sorry, there's no very much <laughs> transition, but I go quickly to the rhinoceros beetles, Guang. Um, as they are enrolled in a very popular game here in Deria, with their, of which their random behavior is the keystone, in my opinion, Kuang are taught as the symbol for local wisdom in the terms of a genuine, genuine ecological relation to the regional environment. This idea, actually, uh, is behind the Museum of Life, Pipitawan and Shiwit in Chiang Rai, where rhinoceros beetles share the room with the giant Mekong catfish, the favorite food of Nagas, by the way. It will be shown that it's not so much the colop the Coleoptera that symbolize a harmonious connection built by human populations with their natural environment. I assume it is more a question of indexicality, one more time, about what happens in the intimate relation between human being on the one side and insect on the other side, what Gregory Betson may have called analogic communication. Beetles actually can act so unpredictably that players are forced in a radical alterity that gives credit, in a way, to their ability to cooperate with natural forces, which are more than often difficult to interpret. As we shall see, the multiple ontologies that players project on Quangs, successively getting interiorities of different nature or not, mirrors, for me, the great variety of Naga's power to transcend realms. The competitions of Beatles are mostly encountered here, uh, in between September and December. That is when the insect finally emerged from the ground, in which it grew from an egg to an adult during eight months to finally get in the air to, uh, to breed. So male specimens are said to be quite materially aggressive, as they would be obsessed by the idea of getting the right to disseminate their genetic factor. But as a matter of fact, you are never sure to what extent it's aggressive or ready to actualize uh, its aggressiveness at the moment you need it. In fact, a thorough ambiguity pervades all the network of Quang fighting, from the collection in the forest up to the fights and through endless training and assessment sessions. One can never be sure when beetles are to appear, where, when, or if they will be good at fighting and evenly aggressive throughout their three month career. So Quang are regarded as also as unable to learn, to develop new abilities. So what can do player is actually to do everything that is possible to reveal the potential of each and every beetle, which takes weeks. Each specimen has the fighting skills that stem primarily from the soil substrate in which it grew up. It's not surprising for me then that this, the traditional way to get beetles is to collect them in wild areas. This is where they find their favorite food bamboo shoots, and, and that are not polluted by the chemicals that they use in the commercial crops. That's what say players. This is where the soil is said to be the most fertile, Udom Sombun, where the most fully developed and perfect specimens are to be found in priority. So at the end, some amateurs try to develop beetles' farming methods, but the little animal resists all the first done to try to breed him. If some experiments lead to the production of big and beautiful coleopterns, they never pro prove to have the lion heart that one can find in the forest beetles, Quang Pa. Oh. I remember Ajahn Chayan telling me last uh, July that finding good rhinoceros beetles uh, was a bit, uh, in Northern Thailand here, was somehow the same problematic as having good spots of mushrooms, you know, if I'm correct in the quoting, like we had in France, actually. Um, okay, so let's say Quang have to come from wide areas. Yet players do insist on the fact that it takes weeks to make a wild specimen, a true fighter, eligible to uh, go up the ring. So the question from then is, what's happening between a player and his beetles since it alleged, allegedly can't learn anything? How can they build the kind of coordination of actions? And the thing is that the old device, from the material apparatus up to the rules and their enforcement, draw on the radical alterity between the two actors, the two species, and the ambiguity of their possible cooperation and communication. Let's come to the game itself. 
So th you can see there an interaction, maybe. So you can, uh, you can try to uh, control your, or co contact with your uh, beetle to direct contact with the stylus. Uh, oh, there's a problem in the area. Okay. Okay, I will skip all this. Just to give you some insights of the of what is going on in a in a fight. So players can influence uh, their the behavior of the of the of their beetles by first uh, direct contact with the stylus before the beginning of the match. After a few minutes period of warm up before the fight, well. Uh, they can uh, they they will free their uh, their beetles simultaneously. Then the players are only authorized to roll and tap their stylus on the log once they have released their champions. Players are then limited to the production of more or less influential vibrations by rolling one stylus on the on the log. Then the uh, players can also. Uh, turn the log around its longitudinal axis in certain circumstances. It's supposed to help a little bit the, the Quang. I will skip this because it's a bit complicated. So as a sum up, let me show you a very short uh, uh, video so you have a fair idea. <laughs> So there you have a, an insight of all the techniques <laughs> that are able to to rely on to to to, to try to to wait on the on the on the, on the fight. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, one one can say uh, one can't say sorry that uh, this is a pure eto naturalistic device, not to say natural, since human call upon many tricks to stimulate the animal instincts. Uh, but the game cannot be reduced either to a pure technical device that would see human players confronting one another through mechanized insects. The beetle, the beetle sorry, actually don't answer the player's comments with very high fidelity. This is not a remote control relation, that's for sure. So it is not, it is not a really great surprise that different ontologies of the Quang do confront themselves and flourish among players. Interestingly, when it comes to interpret the result of such fights, the ponderation in between natural characteristics, either genetics or morphology, psychology, training uh, techniques, players, technicity on the log, etc., etc., vary a lot from one player to another. For example, why some players will attribute victory to animal characteristics for 20%, insects, brave art, 10% training, uh, sorry, <laughs> Uh, fifty percent and players take this city thirty. Others would rather explain it by okay, you can read it. Uh, <laughs> it can change for any player at any time of the game, uh, following he loses, he, he wins or whatever. Uh, behind these different rationals, we find alternative ways of considering the uh, the Beatles ontology. Some will see them as very sensible animal, a kind of nerves bundle, you know, that has no central nervous system and that has to be stimulated but controlled as much as possible. Others, at the very other end of the, of the spectrum, not only attribute a brain, but also a will or uh, even uh, emotions, and some will uh, attribute to, the, to them vital spirits. I, I, I quote you all the, all the terms here. Um, some people will even attribute to this uh, Quang, uh, a Quan, what I call vital spirit, or even a soul, if the Quangs uh, uh, reveal themselves very important champions in the, in the season. Um, if the ones who view Quang as sensible machines prefer stocky beetles with large horns and try to wait, I mean, yeah, you know, try to manipulate the, the log as much as possible during the fight, 
the, the later will favor slimmer beetles, almost, almost tiny, that, but that comes with a long lower horn, which is very important if you want any explanation, I will not tell you, that are supposed more intelligent than their massive counterparts. And most important, they, these players are more prone to not interfere that much on the, on the insect. And once the insect is freed on the log, they actually delegate the control of the match to the beetle to a greater extent. So for me, this is the, really the real strength of uh, uh, this, this game. I mean, to enable the cohabitation you know, between different species, but also between very various con conceptions of continuities and discontinuities between these species. The device upholds a kind of vast network of analogic correspondence between diverse dimensions. Meaningful analogic links can be done and undone endlessly, can be tested infinitely between the insect's phys physicality, in sincerity, its behavior, the result of the fights, etc. Ultimately, by not choosing to make it a human game through insects or a pure animal game in which human would stay just mere spectators, um, the players build on the radical difference in between the two worlds, the two uh, sensible worlds, would say, of Anuskul. Um, so, it's not only difficult to know if a beetle is a good fighter, a better one than another. It's not only hazardous to decide if a Kuang is good because of its natural characteristic or because of the intimacy it builds with a human player. I think it is more fundamentally difficult to frame the actions of a beetle. And the endorsement of the situation, actually on the, on the log, is more than always the result of a more or less long negotiations of the interpretations of the fight by the different parties. I mean, you have the players and, and many gamblers around the, around the log. So, uh, all the parties engaged, or the human parties engaged in the game, have, um, um, how to say, yeah, up to the point, I mean, this culture of negotiation, up to the point that some people will see the, the, the game as uh, the best school for politics in the area. Uh, that's what I was told in many places. Um, so, w when the players claim that we Northern Thais, Lana people, know the true and deep nature of the Kuang, I see from the close observation of the practice a co production of a culture of negotiation. And both parties, Kuang and uh, a human, have to accept to be affected by the other and to experience, as a consequence, a kind of transformation, always open to new possibilities and potentialities. I assume that it is an attitude, this, is the, the, this very attitude that takes us to the very root of how these people think and act, the harmonious relation that they say to foster not only uh, not only with their environment, but within their environment. It can be said thus that if the beetles accept to play with humans, it ultimately imposes its sensory universe while leaving players and gamblers the possibility of appending code, meaning, and technique. So players accept that humankind doesn't have an, an, a control over an, object, ob, an objectified nature, here the Kuang, and that fostering a certainty in relationships uh, can, um, can prove to be virtuous. And interestingly, they have selected and chosen a species in which they can share a certain tendency for playfulness, and thus to reflect upon what it takes to make common worlds with others. One can say that who controlled the game, which could al also be said in the case of the Naga cults. This absent this absence sorry, of control being from uh, the quality of self-organized systems, cybernetic networks characterized by a circular logic that actually tend to reduce disorder, the entropy of the systems, the fragmentation of the interiorities and the, in the physicalities, would say Philippe Descola, maybe. Um, Human deities and animals exchange properties, accept transfor transformation, sorry, through the circulation of unstable similarities and difference between them. To some extent, every player hopes to find every year the king of the king of Kuang, Paya Kuang, that would stem out from a very, very potent place, to quote uh, my colleague, and that would beat 
any of any of the other beetles without any efforts from both the insect and its player. But when you don't meet him, you have to resort to a lot of never-ending experiments to track, to channel, to nurture this flow of life. There is a kind of economy of potential potent places linked one to another. Pilgrims try to catch the supernatural force of the Naga, what they call Reet, and when players celebrate the forces of local Lana nature, a specific way of beings living in Lana, here, Northern Thailand, to engage with each, with each other sorry, harmoniously. These two networks that tie, to tie together as humans, animals, mythical animals, spiritual beings, and affordance on many things like vegetables and minerals in the world. And uh, I will just leave it here to open the discussion. Thank you for your attention. For keeping time, uh, it's uh, time for break, 10 minutes, and then we'll come back. Yeah, at uh, uh, the next section will begin at 10.35, but maybe let's say 10.40. Yeah.